Hello, my AP Calculus AB friends. Mr. Record here from Avon High School. We're going to take a look at our third video that covers example three from topic 3.6 out of the Calculus CED and the curriculum that we use here at Avon High School. And 3.6 is all about taking higher order derivatives. We've had a little bit of practice at that with the first two examples. And in our second example, we're going to revisit this idea of motion of an object that's falling but we're gonna to go to a different location. We're gonna to go to the moon and we're gonna figure all of this out. So we have gravity on the moon versus gravity on the earth. Let's take a look. So here we are with our example three. We'll read it together. It says, because the moon has no atmosphere, a falling object on the moon encounters no air resistance or at least very little or negligible air resistance. Well, back in 1971, astronaut Commander David Scott demonstrated that a feather and a hammer would fall at the same rate on the moon. And this was a part of the Apollo 15 launch uh, with, when we were uh, working with our, our lunar excursion um, NASA uh, plans all throughout the late 60s and 70s. And basically, it's very possible that some of you may have seen an experiment like this. Maybe if you've taken a physics class, a lot of your classrooms might have one of those vacuum tubes where you can suck all the air out of it. And then usually there's like a ball bearing or a marble with a little feather. And if they're all sitting in the bottom of that tube, you can like flip it upside down really quickly and then boom, they fall at the same rate because there's no air that's kind of working underneath that feather causing it to float. So anyway, we have a little bit of a still picture you can see command David Scott there's his geological hammer there in his left in his his right hand and it's kind of hard to see but the feather is right about there so our situation is this well whenever this astronaut was able to make that claim and do some more experimentation with uh, how long it might take for these things to fall, it allowed scientists to finally be able to come up with the true gravitational constant of the moon. You know, for the probably 200, 250, 300 years prior to that, scientists were finally able to understand the gravitational constant on Earth. It all started with Galileo dropping things off of the Leaning Tower of Pisa back long ago, and then that was uh, honed by Isaac Newton and modified a little bit, and we were able to come up with these wonderful gravitational constants. Now, to do this particular problem, we would have to understand a little bit of more information because we have this position function for falling objects on the moon, denoted by S of t as negative 0.81 t squared plus 2. The 2 is going to act as the initial position probably makes sense because I think we talk about the height being measured in meters and the time in seconds. So this particular astronaut was going to drop something from about a two meter distance from the ground, a little bit more than maybe head high. So maybe he was actually going to raise his hand and then drop that hammer. Now, in order to find the ratio of the Earth's gravitational force to the moon, there's a, another piece of information that we're going to have to know. We would have to know if this experiment was conducted on the Earth, what would the S of t equation be? This would require some knowledge. You would have to know that the gravitational constant in meters per second per second on Earth is negative 9.8. That's a number that you may have been familiar with, you may have been exposed to. Some of you might be, no, wait a minute, I didn't learn, uh, I didn't learn that number. I learned negative 32. Well, that's correct as well if we were dealing with feet. Now the problem is that negative 9.8 is actually going to be cut in half as it resides in front of the t squared coefficient for your position equation. And it's likely if you're watching this video and you're doing so say in the first semester of your calculus class, you don't know what integration is at this point, but that would help us kind of understand why we take half of that negative 9.8. But as we can see here, this negative 4.9 in a moment is going to be squared, or I'm sorry, is going to be multiplied by 2 when we take the derivative, and it's going to achieve that value. The good news is, on the AP Calculus exam, you will not have to memorize these. Any particle motion problem on the AP exam is always going to be about an object moving sideways. 
typically on an x-axis for calculus A, B. There's already a physics exam, right, that will test whether or not uh, a student would know uh, kinematic motion when you have items falling out of the sky and thus are suspected to gravity. All right, so how do we figure this out? Well, pretty simple. To find that ratio, we just simply take the Earth's coefficient, negative 4.9, and we'll divide it by that moon's coefficient, negative 0.81. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, shouldn't I have taken the derivative? Well, okay, what if you did take the derivative and found velocity? And hopefully, if you watched the previous video, you now understand that the derivative of position is velocity. And if I do that for the moon, right, let's do the same thing. Let's find the velocity for the moon. Let's say that this is the velocity for the Earth. And the moon velocity with respect to t would be negative 1.62, I believe t to the first plus zero. If we were to go one step further, let's say that we took the derivative one more time and got into our acceleration world, the acceleration on Earth, well, that derivative is a constant. And the acceleration with the moon, that derivative is going to be a constant. I could have divided those. You will find out very soon that these ratios are going to be equivalent. So it really wouldn't matter which one you decided to divide. Now, I'm not going to drag the calculator into this because I know that you could probably type this in, but I believe you get 6.049. That would be that ratio. That would be that fractional values equivalence. And so it's often said that the Earth's gravitational pull is six times as much as the Earth. Well, that's the same as saying that the moon, uh, the, the, let me say that again, the Earth's gravitational pull is six times that of the moon. And sometimes we could flip that around and say the moon's gravitational pull is one sixth of the Earth. And, and so <clears throat> one of the things that I often thought of, especially as a, as a student when, when I was taking calculus and physics and learned about this, is does that mean that somebody who went to the moon could, could perform athletic feats six times as great? For example, Michael Jordan had, a, had actually a little bit more than a 40-inch vertical leap. I think it was more like 46 uh, inches or 44 inches. But if we just round it down to 40 inches, maybe say later in his career, if we were to multiply that by six, that's 240 inches, which is the same as 20 feet. So could Michael Jordan jump 20 feet straight in the air if he was on the moon? Kind of makes you wonder. Let's take somebody else, a golfer, a famous golfer like a Tiger Woods. Maybe somebody like Tiger could drive a golf ball 300 yards, and most of the time they can drive it farther than that. Well, if we multiply that by six, we get 1,800 yards. Okay, well, if you multiply that by three, that's 5,400 feet, which is greater than one mile because there's about 5,280 feet in a mile. So a golfer could drive a golf ball on the moon a mile. Sure it would be interesting to play golf on the moon then, wouldn't it? Well, whether these things are true or not is really not part of this video. It's not part of the course, but it's kind of something to, to get you thinking. I have some beliefs that these feats probably can't be performed on the moon, mostly because of the bulky space equipment that the athlete would have to wear. But let's say down the road in the year 2300, maybe some of you are going to be watching this video then. I don't know. We all have form-fitting spacesuits, and then we could do athletic feats like this on the moon. Should be interesting to find out. <laughs> anyway, I hope you found this video a little bit interesting. We have one more problem that we're going to solve in video number four for topic uh, 3.6. We hope to see you then. Take care.